this is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his final lecture in New Testament History, Literature, and Theology, session number 27. This is the book of Revelation. And I'm going to tell a story just because, anyways, that's how I do things. But anyways, once upon a time, I was in a master's psych program with a guy named Dr. Larry Crabb. And Crabb was one of the best teachers, kind of, you have, uh, students just love this guy. And he came in the last week, and uh, it was like, you know, several days before finals, and he said, hey, I just read this great book. Man, it's the best book I ever read in my life. And so, you guys need to read this book. So what I'm doing for the final is I'm assigning a book this is like three days before the final. I'm assigning this book so that you guys can read it just before the, you know, to, and we'll go over it on the final exam. You'll be tested over in the final exam. Now, what happened? This guy was like the best professor ever. What happened when he did that? All the students go, <laughs> just it was like a disaster. What a way to end a course. You end up with all this, you know, thinking, well, let's think we got three days left. I got to read this stupid book. And it was a great book and things, but it was just out of thing. And I, I started thinking about that, and then I also think about Proverbs. Sorry for going on, but Proverbs has this thing where you don't, you don't swap a horse in the middle of the stream. Has anybody ever heard that? You don't swap a horse in the middle of the stream. Or to pro, my friend Probo, you, when you go to a dance, you, you leave with the same girl that you came with, okay? My wife doesn't dance, so it's not relevant to us, but that's what he said. He says, you, you know, you leave with the girl that you came with. That was a big thing with him. So all that to say, does anybody know what those Proverbs mean? <laughs> okay, here's the meaning of the proverb, okay? And I just say that to get your ire up a little bit and stuff. I have this 500-page book that you got. <laughs> no. Um, I, I learned from that. And what, what I, I think, I started thinking about the class, and you guys have gotten used to the Quizlet format and all that kind of stuff. And what I'm saying is I don't think I should switch gears in the middle of like for the final and stuff so what I'm thinking is why don't we work on those three lectures where the Quizlets I have the questions for the Quizlets and they're already built okay the last five lectures I don't have um, how should I say I didn't even have video Ben's been doing it for this class and so um, now what's the problem the problem is then you say well I don't need to know I don't need to know nothing um, so let me maybe make um, I'll tell you what, maybe on each lecture I'll make like one question that'll be kind of a generic question for each one that you can just go over and if you've been taking notes and stuff it'll be good. Let me think about that more, but what I'm saying is the exam will focus on those three lectures where you have the Quizlet questions. I may have a few other questions, but they'll be fair, and then the Revelation questions you'll have. And I do that because I don't think, I, I, you know, when I, I get you to, I, I learned you, I learned you one way, and then I think it's not good to switch over and stuff just because I haven't got the stuff built. The stuff doesn't exist. I mean, Ben's making it exist right now. So anyway, so you can warn the students of next year. It will be ready next year, but uh, so you can warn them to take somebody else, hopefully. But anyways, okay, so is that clear? And then let me clarify it. Well, is it okay if I send you guys an email explaining what I just said? In, in detail and stuff, and I'll send that out to you guys. But basically, focus on those three lectures where, give me, give me tonight and tomorrow. Um, my wife is picking up her father today, and um, he's dead anyways, and so it, there's a lot of stuff going on. But I'll, I'll try to get this done tomorrow, and um, anyways, and so I'll have that ready for you Thursday morning, okay? All right? And then the Revelation stuff, the Revelation stuff will be ready Thursday or Friday, the questions, the readings, and stuff like that in the memory verses, so just do those, so, okay? Um, now, Ben, there's a guy walking out in the hall. If you could catch him and tell him the sound's not working, and I think it's the back there. Anyways, I uh, just saw Chris Emming out there and stuff. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. The sound isn't working here, and I, I got everything turned on. Um, this is Chris Emming. He is the man, okay? And, uh, all right. He has the magic touch. You're going to stay here, right? But yeah, the, but I got it all on. Yeah. See, right there, on, on. I'm cool. Yeah. This one here is on. Yeah. So I wonder if it's in the back. No, I'm thinking that it also could be. <laughs> okay, um, so he says just keep teaching and things, so that's okay. I'll yell loud. Um, today what I'd like to do is go over the book of Revelation. And, uh, 
There's a couple ways that I could have done the book of Revelation. Um, okay. So, okay. Any, is it, do I hear it a little bit there? Okay. Just ignore him. So the book of Revelation, there's a couple ways of handling it. One would be kind of to do a left behind, uh, what does the newspaper say, what are the nuclear arms happening, and then import those things from make Iran and the Ayatollahs or something, the Antichrist or something like that. And um, that'd be one way. The other way, is that, which is usually done, is that people just skip the book of Revelation because Revelation's hard and, and it's hard, difficult to figure out. Uh, I've taught a whole course in the book of Revelation once and I, I thought I knew what I was doing. Since then, as you get older, you kind of, um, I thought I knew what I was doing when I was younger, and I realize now that I don't. So unfortunately, I'll share that side of things to you too. But uh, let me just say this. In the Bible, there is a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Remember back to Genesis? There is a beginning, and then things move through the patriarchs. They move through David. They, they move to this expectation of this king who would come. Jesus comes, but then Jesus dies, and then all of a sudden Jesus is, says he's coming back again. And so there's this great hope, but I, what I'm interested in that you get is the no, two notions. One is that history moves from a beginning to a middle to an end, and that's really important. By the way, does your life, does your life move beginning, middle, and end? And you guys are on the kind of the beginning of the middle of your life kind of thing, and then there's an end to the story. And what I'm saying is that means something then because it gives meaning to the decisions that are made along the way. Time is not circular, okay? Things aren't just circular. So you say, I get up every morning, I do the thing. It doesn't matter what I do because I get up, I do the same thinking thing day in, day out. And what does my life matter? It's all circular. I go to the dust. I came from the dust. I go back to the dust. So what? And, and basically, life becomes meaningless in the circular kinds of ways of thinking. What I'm suggesting is that life is not circular. There are patterns in life that are spiraled, but they're spiraling to an end. And so, yeah, Chris, I think, Chris, I think we got it. Good man. Anyways, Chris Hemming, he's the man. Now, let me just read a passage out of 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. It says, But we know that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Even as Christ is pure, we purify ourselves. So in other words, when we look for Christ's coming, we prepare ourselves. How do we prepare ourselves to meet Christ? He says, we purify ourselves to be pure even as he is pure. Now, what I want to do is look at this uh, revelation, and I want to discuss this kind of, uh, and I don't want to do the newspaper exegesis kind of thing, and I don't want to things, I do want to stress the notion of hope. And that's one of the big themes of the book of Revelation, that Jesus is coming back, and that should cause us to hope. In other words, there is a wonderful end to the story of this world. There is a wonderful end to the story of this world. The world doesn't, do you guys ever get depressed and stuff? Actually, this is finals week. This is probably a good time to talk about it. People get depressed and you start going in a cycle and you say, I got so much stuff to do. Some, some student came up to me and says, hey, where's the Quizlet stuff on the last three lectures? And I thought, oh, stink, I didn't build that yet? It was like, oh, nuts. That just, and now I know where tomorrow and, you know, it's out the window, okay? And so... What I'm saying is life is like that. You get disappointment, disappointment, and disappointment. And what I like is that the book of Revelation leaves us with hope that sometime Jesus is coming back and we're going to see him face to face. And we're going to be in the presence of God forever and ever. And so that hope, this is called the blessed hope of something that we hope for. And, and the question is, what do you really hope for in life? What do you really hope for? Do you hope to be rich? Do you hope to be, you know, nice home, nice family? What types of things do you hope for? And in Scripture, the hope for is the return of Christ and the meeting him in the air. Now, the problem with the book of Revelation is it's a literary genre. Okay, this is a literary genre, and basically it's apocalyptic. And when I say apocalyptic, that has certain meanings. When, you say, when I say apocalypse now, what is apocalypse? Is it about the end of the world? An apocalypse like apocalypse now is the end of the world. The world's going to blow up or, or um, you know... Uh, you know, 24, he's going to, you know, nuclear weapons are going to go off all over the place and stuff. And uh, so the end of the world. The book of Revelation is also a letter. It's also a letter written from John to the seven churches. So as Galatians is a letter, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians is a letter. So the book of Revelation, longer letter, but it's a letter. And then thirdly, it's a prophecy. 
It tells something, it preaches, but it also teaches about the future. So I want to look at what is the five features of, of apocalyptic literature. And so I want to just run through, in order to understand this literature, it's strange stuff. The Book of Revelation is strange stuff because it's apocalyptic. And the first thing is on this is there's symbolism. There's going to be symbolism in the book. You say, well, I take the Bible literally. Well, unfortunately, when you get into the book of Revelation, you can't take it literally. There are symbols there. There's, it's a high apocalyptic literature. It uses high levels of symbolism. If you take things literally, you're going to be having all sorts of strange critters running around with, with uh, you know, animals with lion's heads on them and stuff like that. It just doesn't make sense. And so there's going to be symbolism. So let me just give you an example of this in chapter 1, verse 20. It says, talks about the candlesticks. And the candlesticks equal the churches. So that you're, you see these candlesticks, candle holders, the candlesticks equal the church. So in chapter 1, verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven stars are angels of the seven churches. Does your church have an angel? Okay, so what does this mean by angel? By the way, do you realize that the word angel can simply mean messenger? It can simply mean messenger. So he may be not talking about a winged creature that flies around your church or something like that, but rather somebody who's bringing the message to the church. So he says you've got seven stars or seven angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So we know that the lampstands stand for something else. And this is called symbolism. One thing stands for something else. And that gives us a hint in chapter 1 that this book is going to be highly filled with symbolism. And therefore, we've got to keep our eyes open. Pictorial language kind of things. Now, angels. Apocalyptic literature, whether I'm talking about the apocalypse of Peter, for example, or apocalyptic literature that was known at the time, usually you have an angel who accompanies the guy who's recording the apocalypse. So all of a sudden, some angel will show up, Gabriel, or what's the name of some other, uh, Raphael or something, some, an angel will show up and basically guide the person through and tell the person the story. Uh, this, this angelic guide or mediator will be there. And so in chapter 17, or chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So John's going to write it, an angel's going to mediate this thing, and so you're going to see angels popping up in the narrative uh, throughout apocalyptic literature. It's kind of uh, normal. Here's, here's something that's really interesting. Um, when John sees an angel, he's going to freak out, okay? And so he's going to fall down in front of this angel. And in chapter 22, verse 8, it says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and seen, had seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing me. Okay, so he falls down at the feet of this angel. Now, what's, what's an angel going to do? John, I take it as the apostle John, falls down at the feet of the angel. What's the angel going to do? He, he starts worshiping the angel because the angel's like awesome. And he you know, tells this angel, starts to worship him. What's the angel do? Does the angel receive worship? No. There's only one being in the universe that receives worship. That's God. Okay? So this angel then says, But he, the angel, said to me, Do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and the prophets. Worship God. And he actually rebukes them and says, Hey, don't worship me. I'm, I'm just kind of a servant thing. Worship God. And uh, does that. So angels will be involved. Visions and dreams. And so we'll get visions and dreams. Uh, John Revelation chapter 1, verses 9, it says, I, John, your brother and companion in suffering in the kingdom and in patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the Isle of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony. Apparently he was exiled to this Isle of Patmos. They, they would put uh, prisoners on islands. They would cut down all the trees so the people couldn't get away from the island. They cut down all the trees, put the people out there, and then they're basically, sounds like, uh, does America ever use an island to incarcerate people and they can't get away? Does anybody, Alcatraz, sound familiar and stuff? You ever swim across it? Anyways, okay. So uh, this is kind of how they imprisoned them in the past. You just put them on this island again. So it says, and it was on the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Thar Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. 
So he says, okay, send this out and things, and he's going to have this vision then on the spirit on the Lord's day, visions and dreams. Okay, dreams are at night when he's asleep, visions when he's awake. Um, the scope of an apocalyptic literature will always be the end of time. Okay, so it's the end of the world. So apocalyptic literature will always talk about the end of the world, how things are going to blow up or what's going to happen at the end of the world. Um, so the end of all things, it's cosmic in scope. Usually, uh, actually, is Star Wars apocalyptic a little bit? Is Star Wars apocalyptic a little bit? Yeah, yeah, it talks about the end and some of the worlds make it and some of them don't and that kind of stuff. So there's things like that where there's talking about the end of the world and a cosmic kind of thing, big things happening in the universe kind of thing. So, and then lastly, dualism. In apocalyptic literature, there's a real sharp uh, bifurcation between good and evil. Good and evil. So you have the forces of darkness and the forces of light. Actually, am I talking about Star Wars now? Anyways, where there's this bifurcation between, you know, the good and bad, and then you've got what? Then the bad shows up, and then he's got a little good in him. You've got a good guy who's got a little bad in him and stuff, and then you work it out like that. Um, I, anyways, okay. So this dualism, in apocalyptic literature, there'll be this, this sharp um, cleavage between what's good and what's evil. And so you'll have the kind of the heroes, the white knights kind of thing. You'll have this other stuff, the, the features of darkness and, and Satan and evil. And so there's a, a clear-cut dualism. Now, I'm going to be referring constantly to this fellow, David Matthewson, who used to teach here. He's one of the leading people in the world in the book of Revelation, in my opinion. And he taught here. I also went out, traced him down out to Denver and videotaped him doing 30 lectures on the book of Revelation. So if you want a real detailed study of the book of Revelation or something like that, Matthewson does 30 hours on it. By the way, he also does three lectures on Revelation where he did the whole of Revelation in three lectures. And he put that at the end of his New Testament class. I'm putting that up on YouTube. Does anybody know that thing they call the YouTube now? Anyways, you can go and you watch these videos. It's kind of an interesting thing. I'm just mocking myself out. But anyway, so I'm putting it up on YouTube, and um, it'll give me a week or so with that, and Dave's stuff will be up there. Dave, when he talks about apocalyptic literature, he talks about it as if it's a political satire. Okay, do you ever watch those cartoons where they draw, where a political satirist draws a picture and things? And so, for example, if you were in America and you had somebody do a, an elephant and then they had a donkey kicking the elephant in the face. Would, would that be a political statement in, in America? Donkey kicking the elephant in the face. Okay? And what I'm saying is because we're in America, we know donkey stands for, I always get those mixed up. Donkey stands for, anyways, one group and the, the elephant, I'm just joking, but anyways, the, uh, the elephant stands for the other group, okay? And so, and then there's this tussle between the donkey and the elephant and stuff. We know those as two political parties, two political parties. Let's suppose you go out 100 years from now and people look back. Is it possible people would forget what the donkey and the elephant stood for? You say, no, everybody will know that. No, it's possible they forget that. And what I'm saying is when you look back on history sometimes, there's all these embedded historical references. Things like, uh, what does 666 stand for anyways? Okay, and so there are these political things that if you were in that culture, you might know it very well. Like if I started talking about I better not talk about that. Let's jump to something else. I was thinking about something in the late 90s that had to do with, um, anyways, a certain person, but I better not. I'll jump older. Now, let me use uh, Richard Nixon. And if I start talking about Richard Nixon kind of stuff, is that pretty much out of our culture? And if, if you guys were to jump back, then you probably, a lot of the nuances and things you just you wouldn't catch because of this, you know, you, this, the story of Richard Nixon's been over for a long time. So, okay. So what, I'm, what he's suggesting is that the book of Revelation is a political cartoon. Okay, let me say that again. I think this really helps understanding the book, that the book of Revelation is a political cartoon, and therefore it's got all sorts of references that are kind of hidden from us because it was written back then. By the way, should, by the way was the book written to us or was the book written to churches 2,000 years ago? Was the book written to us or was it written to seven churches 2,000 years ago? So what I'm saying is we're the ones that are on the outside looking in. It was originally written to the seven churches. They would know these images. They would know the symbolism. They would know the donkey and the elephant. They would just know that. Okay. Um, so, okay. So think about it as a political cartoon, a political statement, a political satire, actually. Something like that. Apocalyptic literature. 
The author seems to be John. Um, some people say it's John the Elder, who's not John the Apostle. I would say it's John, you know, John John, the guy who, um, you know, John John. That, that sounds like it should be in Star Wars, John John. Anyways, uh, sorry. Uh, but anyways, um, that John is the Apostle John. Now, there's different approaches to the book. What I'd like to do is survey all the approaches, do pros and cons to the basically four approaches to the book of Revelation. And then I'm going to give you, um, and actually, I've got to stand here. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to walk way over to the left, and I'm going to give you my opinion, and, and, and then we'll work on this uh, together. First of all is the preterite view, the preteristic view or the preterite view. When I say preterite, has anybody had much grammar? When I say preterite, what does that mean? Does preterite mean like past tense? Okay, the past tense is the preterite tense. And so the preterite view basically looks at the book as, as recording something that's happened in history and that this was all in the first century. In other words, they say that the book of Revelation is basically a, uh, a symbolic way of describing the wrestlings of the early church in the first century. Okay, the preterite view says basically the book of Revelation is just a satirical way of writing about the first century. Okay, and therefore it's about Nero, who was a nasty dude, of, of uh, Caesar, uh, our uh, emperor. And there was also Domitian, who also killed Christians and did bad stuff and stuff. And they are, they are possibly related to the beasts uh, that would uh, devour people and things like that. Um, now, what's the benefit of this preterite view saying that the book of Revelation is not about the 20th century and all this 21st century and stuff, but it's actually about the first century. It relates really well to the first century church. Paul, John is writing to the first century church, so they would have understood some of this stuff. For example, he mentions a, a city on seven hills, and he mentions Babylon. Babylon, he keeps talking about Babylon and the, you know, the beast in Babylon and stuff like that. But everybody knows if you're in the first century, when they referred to Babylon, it was really talking about what? Rome. Okay, Babylon, if you go over to Peter, Peter says, he called, Peter is in Rome, he's gonna, Peter is going to die in Rome. First, second Peter, he mentions that he's in Babylon. Well, everybody knows he's not in Babylon, Babylon in Mesopotamia. Peter is in Rome. So Babylon was a code word by which they, occur, they referred to Rome. So, that, in other words, so we, we begin to see some of the stuff. When he says Babylon, they would have known immediately that was Rome, not Babylon over in Mesopotamia. So, so there's an advantage of this position because it allows the first century church recipients, it allows the recipients of the letter to understand the letter. And that's a good thing, okay? What are the disadvantages? Um, The disadvantage of this is if it all took place in the first century, that means that it's not apocalyptic, which is about the end of the world. The end of the world didn't end in the first century. The end of the world is still going on now. By the way, are we closer to the end of the world now? Is, is it possible the world could end now? And by the way, do we have weapons that could blow up half this place? Yeah. Okay. Do you realize that up until what? The, Actually, by 1940 or 1950, let's say 1950, okay, 1950, could the world blow up? In 1950, could the world blow up? You said, oh, yeah, we got some nuclear weapons and stuff, but we had what? We took out two cities and stuff like that. Could they really blow up the world? No. Have we got stuff now that will, could <laughs> blow things to smithereens, okay? Yeah, much more powerful than we had before. So I'm saying is some of the things that the book talks about have never been possible, have never been possible throughout 2,000 years, and they are possible now. And that, that just makes me wonder. So, so the advantage is the first century people understood it. The disadvantage is that, it, um, that Christ didn't come back in the first century. Christ did not come back in the first century. So it can't be all about the first century because the book ends with the coming of Christ, and Christ has not come yet. So there's some disadvantages to this approach, and therefore I, I think it squeezes too much. It takes a whole book of Revelation and squeezes it in the first century. I just think it squeezes too much into the first century. And so this is, uh, the book talks about what must soon take place. New Jerusalem at the end of the book, you're going to read New Jerusalem's coming down out of heaven. New Jerusalem hasn't uh, come down out of heaven now. Jerusalem now is about ready to explode, you know, with uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. So... Anyway, so there's disadvantages to this preterite view, so it makes me say, hmm, hmm. Now, another approach to the book of Revelation is that this is really talking about idealistic kinds of concepts. 
In other words, it's a conceptual book that's talking about um, various things that have to do with, um, it's not about telling the future, but it's telling about spiritual truth. So it's using these images to describe spiritual truths of good and evil, the struggle between good and evil. And so some people that take the idealistic view, they say, all we can tell about the book of Revelation is that the good wins in the end. Have you ever heard that? I don't understand the book of Revelation. All I know is that good wins in the end. And I want to say that's, that's good when you're you know, 14 or 15 to say that. But as you get older, you realize that answer doesn't really satisfy. I mean, it does some. I'm glad good wins in the end. But there's a whole lot more in the book of Revelation than just simply the good wins in the end. And so I think that's, that's a very reductive way to look at it. So the language um, in this idealistic view, then all these things are talking about symbolic things. And I think the problem was it, is that it's not all symbolic. And so there's this mix of figurative language and, re, and literal language, and you've got to sort through um, those things. The advantage, why I like the idealistic view, is that it, it, it lifts things in terms of the cosmic character of God. It allows you to think of big things about God and how the world works and good and evil works and how those things go. And so I think I like that. It gives spiritual value to the book. And I think the book of Revelation has tremendous spiritual value. And so the idealistic view, seeing the ideas that are being portrayed here, helps us to understand the book actually does give us a whole lot of things about, um, about God and about this world and about ourselves. The disadvantage is that it disconnects it from history. The idealistic view puts it all in terms of ideals and it cuts it off from history. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the book of Revelation seems to be very well embedded into history. And by the way, if, if the whole book of Revelation is idealistic, what's going to happen then with the return of Christ? Is the return of Christ idealistic? In other words, Christ is never really going to come back because it's just idealistic, you know, whatever. And so we just kind of go on and Christ never comes back. It's all you know, it's all theory, it's all um, idealism, and never hits reality. I want to say Christ actually is physically going to come back. And so if you believe it physically comes back, then the book has to touch history. It has to work with history. Now, there's a, th a third view, which basically sees the book of Revelation as historical. That is, it looks back through history, and it says Rome fell in what, 476? I'm making it up, Josh been in the ballpark of 476, Rome falls. That was a huge thing. So the falling of Rome is described in the book of Revelation. Constantinople falls in 457, 14, 1457, Constantinople falls. And now it's called Istanbul. But anyways, so Constantinople falls. That's a huge movement. The Protestant Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. Let me just, I'm just going to do this just for fun. In the, in the book of Revelation, you've got two witnesses. According to the Reformation, then, you've got one witness is what? Martin Luther. The other one's John Calvin. And so you've got the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. Do you see what I'm saying? You interpret it in light of church history. That's actually, that's a sim why don't I just say it simply like that? So they take the book of Revelation and they stretch it out over 2,000 years of church history, and they see major events in church history as being recorded in the book of Revelation. The pro okay, so that's cool because you can actually see that in certain times these plagues hit. Some of the plagues hit were really, really nasty plagues. There's plagues described in the book of Revelation. So when see, people see these plagues, they say, hey, this is the book of Revelation being fulfilled. So this, the historical view then says that basically through church history, you see the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. Um, now there's some problems with that. As time goes on and church history goes on, do these people have to keep changing their stuff because more recent stuff has happened and so they continually change their perspective and so this historical view is always kind of on the fly changing stuff as more things happen in the church. I mean where is Billy Graham? Where is Billy Graham in the book of Revelation? Okay, Billy Graham is one of the greatest preachers probably in three, 300 years and where, where, where's Billy Graham in the book? Is Billy Graham occur there or maybe was well, this Islam? Does the, book of, uh, does the book of Revelation describe Islam? And so then people start, you know, making connections and stuff. I, I, don't, I don't do that, okay? I just think it's a wrong road to go down. So you've got to be careful with this historical thing because then people start interpreting these events according to the book of Revelation. I think it's very speculative. This, that's the biggest problem I have. It's very speculative. It's very speculative. And the speculation changes every 50, 50 100 years. They've got to add all these other things. And so I think this is the, probably the weakest of any of the views. Now, some people take the book of Revelation as being futuristic. 
and this would be the last position, that they take it as being in the future, to describing a future, what they would call tribulation period. Uh, I grew up with that environment. Um, it was called dispensationalism at the time. To even mention dispensationalism, a school like this, um, caused people to laugh and stuff because it, they, a lot of people have dismissed it. And I, unfortunately, I think they dismiss it before they really understand it. But anyway, um, so what the, they would take, the book of Revelation, they'd say the first three chapters are written to the seven churches. So the first three chapters are written to the seven churches, and that was for back in the first century. But then chapters four through the end of the book are about the future. And so they would look and say there's going to be a seven-year period where things are going to break down. In this seven-year period of tribulation, there's going to be all sorts of bad stuff happening. And then Christ is going to come, and there's going to be a millennium, you know, millennium come on, thousand-year reign of Christ. And then, then ultimately we'll go into the eternal state. And so this is... Uh, yeah, and I'll show you a graph kind of of how they lay that out. It's very straightforward for a lot of people. This is um, the problem with the, I like certain aspects of it. The advantage of this approach is that the, the book is a futuristic genre, okay? It's the liber apocalyptic literature, you know, does facilitate the end of all things kind of things. Um, it also coordinates with the book of Daniel. And are, are any of you guys in churches where they, um, they discuss Revelation and Daniel are the two books that they camp on? Um, uh, what I'm saying is certain churches, if you're in a Reformed church, what church are they going to, what, what part of scripture are they going to camp on? If you're in a Reformed Presbyterian kind of background, you do a lot with Romans and Galatians, okay? If you're in a Mennonite, uh, if you're in a Mennonite church, you're going to do a lot with the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Peace, love, Sermon on the Mount kind of stuff. If you're in a, a more, how should I say, Baptistic, uh, dispensational thing, you're going to do Daniel and Revelation are going to be your two big books. And so, um... So these books, the book of Daniel talks about the future. And so you have to coordinate those two things. And so there's certain things I like. Now, what are the disadvantages of this futuristic approach? The disadvantage is that you're left with books like Left Behind. Are you familiar with the Left Behind series and things? And so that you're left with these people picking up the newspaper <clears throat> back in the 19, actually it was after the Civil War when I grew up. Uh, there was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And they basically had like a million, many multiple millions of copies of Lake Great Planet Earth. In which he took the book of Revelation and took what was going on with the Vietnam War and all this kind of stuff. Then the book of Revelation, you're going to see these critters come out and they're going to be like, they're going to be like locusts with like the head of a man and the stinger of a scorpion in their back. And he, would, he said basically that he thought those were, those were helicopters in Vietnam because the stinger is in its tail. And so the helicopters would shoot out the tails. And, and so he basically said that these helicopters were in things from the Vietnam War. And this guy was Hale Lindsay and stuff like that. And the book sold millions of copies. I actually thought the guy was probably old enough. I thought he passed away. But I was on, t I don't know, some weird television thing. And all of a sudden I saw the guy again. And he's in his early 70s now. And by the way, is he still saying the same stuff? <laughs> and it's just like, man, some people never learn. But anyways, um, so that my problem is, is the speculative nature, trying to speculate with a newspaper in hand and say, oh, this is... This is the end of the world. This person is bringing on this calamity. Uh, this person is the Antichrist. That person is the Antichrist. Um, what, do you remember two years ago, there was a guy named Camping that said on May 12th, there was going to be the end of the world. And my students then, I told them, there's no finals then. The end of the world's coming the 12th. Our exam was on the 13th, man. You're good to go. Okay. And so the problem was, is that we passed the 12th and uh, they didn't all disappear. Oh, oh, that's right. He miscalculated. He miscalculated. Okay? And so these people always have some sort of excuse why they're, they're... By the way, when the Bible says if a prophet, if a prophet gives a false prophet, see, what's supposed to be done with that prophet? Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, I just so I chill out. I'm not trying to stone this guy, but I just think he's a, he's a misguided old man, and he's wanting Christ to come, and I want Christ to come as well. But you got to be really careful about speculating like that. So the futuristic thing leads to a lot of this stuff. And by the way, that's uh, Tim LaHaye in the Left Behind series. And if you go down to Liberty University, you'll see whole buildings dedicated <coughs> and supported by Dr. Tim LaHaye, who made millions on this Left Behind stuff. So uh, maybe we could use some of that, Gordon. But anyways, uh, <laughs> that was a joke. Okay. Anyways, okay. Now... Okay, 
this, this is really funny where it gets funny. Normally I weigh, walk way over to the left and Ben's taping me. So Ben, I'm wanting to walk way over to the left now. And I'm going to tell you my opinion on this book. And um, now you say, or student, why don't you just tell us the facts, what the Bible says? What I'm telling you is that I don't know anybody who knows exactly what's all going on in the book of Revelation. Uh, here's the way I look at it now. I've changed my position in the last three years. I've changed my position on it. So what I'm telling you is what I'm telling you the truth. And the answer is no. Is this something that I've made up trying to understand this book? Yes. Now you say, well, I don't care what you think. Well, that's fine, okay. I just happen to be a professor or whatever, whatever. Um, but my question is, what do you think about the book of Revelation? How do you understand the book of Revelation? And so here's, here's the way I look at it now. Um, I look at the book of Revelation as apocalyptic literature mixed with what I want to call wisdom literature. The wisdom literature and apocalyptic literature go together sometimes. And when I'm in wisdom literature, are you familiar with Proverbs? Proverbs, okay. A wise son or daughter brings joy to a father. A foolish son or daughter is a grief to his mother. A wise son or daughter is, 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 brings joy to a father. A foolish son or daughter brings grief to his mother. When does that happen? How often does that happen? Whenever you have a foolish son, does the mother get hurt? Whenever you've got a wise son or daughter, does the, the father be happy about that? Yes. So that proverb, is that proverb instantiated in real life repeatedly? Okay? It's repeatedly instantiated. So you get the theory of wise son or daughter brings joy to his father, foolish son or daughter brings grief to his mother, and that, that then in each family that's inculcated or it's instantiated into real life. I use the word instantiate. Is anybody in computer science and stuff? Um, anyways, there's a computer term that's called instantiation. And what I'm saying is you've got a theory here, you've got a proverb here, and then you see it actually worked out in life, okay? You see it worked out in life. And what I'm suggesting is that the book of Revelation gives us wisdom in that way. Um, at the end of the book, it says this, and this is what opened my eyes to this approach, okay? Now, I'm not saying I've got it down. At the end of the book, it says, whoever adds to this book, what will be added to him? Whoever adds anything to this book, the plagues of this book will be added to that person. That means then that if somebody did that around 1000 AD and added something to the book, the plagues of this book would come in that person. Or if you're in the 21st century, that the plagues would come in the person that adds in this. So in other words, what I'm saying is he's saying whoever adds this book, wherever time period you're at, the plagues of this book are going to come upon you, which made me begin to realize that these plagues may have happened repeatedly in history. And that's why the historical approach says that these things have happened in church history and they go back and say, well, look, this is what happened in the fall of Rome. This is what happened in the fall of Constantinople. This was the big, great bubonic plague as being described here. And so they see it happening repeatedly. So what I'm suggesting is that the book of Revelation is kind of like wisdom literature, where some of these plagues and things like that have been instantiated repeatedly throughout history, awaiting a coming big one, okay? Awaiting a coming big one. So these are, we see the plagues and stuff happen repeatedly in history, awaiting a coming big one, okay? When this thing will really happen in the Antichrist or whoever will show up and then the, the big one will happen. Okay? Um, all right, does that, does that make sense to anybody? Um, how comfortable am I with that? I'm not very comfortable with it. Let me shoot my own theory down. Um, here's how I shoot my own theory down. Question, Hellebrand, have you ever heard anybody else come up with that idea? And the answer is no. When you're the only one saying something, um, does that tell you something? Yes, it tells you you're crazy, okay? And so what I'm saying is, that's the way I look at it, but what I'm saying is, that's how I understand it with the best I work with wisdom and I work with apocalyptic literature. That's the best I, I'm doing now. What I'm saying is because, you know, I'm not saying this is gospel, it's just how I understand the book at the time. I basically, Dave turned my head upside down and this is where I kind of tried to land on my feet. And you say, Hildebrandt, you didn't land on your feet, you landed on your head. And he turned you upside down. And so what I'm saying is that the book of Revelation could, aspects of it can be seen repeatedly throughout history. And that I'm awaiting a day when Christ will return in reality and the big, you know, Jesus will actually land on the earth and that kind of stuff. 
So that's how I look at it. Those are the old historical approaches and things like that, various approaches and things. And I think, I don't know, I think it's important to think about this stuff and things. Here is what they call a premillennial timeline. This is what a lot of people grew up with in my generation after the Civil War. And basically what this happens is you go way over to the, the, the side here on, the, on the, what you guys is the left. You've got 2,000 years of church history. You've got 2,000 years of church history in which church history happened. The book of Revelation starts this, what they call the seven-year period of the tri tribulation. There's seven years of this great, what they call the great tribulation. By the way, this is a dispensational model. And, I, and you say, Hildebrandt, you don't hold this anymore. But what I'm doing is just presenting it. it. This was held back in the 1950s and 60s, 70s, 1950s, 60s, 70s. This was a big model that was used. So the tribulation period, Christ then comes. Do you notice that there's three markers for Christ coming? One is before the tribulation period. They call that the pre-trib rapture. Has anybody ever heard of the rapture? The rapture is when Christ comes back and he takes his people out. And by the way, there's passages in Thessalonians say that, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first and we'll be caught up and the one, two people will be at a mill. One will be taken and one will be left behind. Okay, and so that's where these books get off. By the way, are those books based on a kernel of truth? And the answer is yeah. Okay, now he goes off and does all this weird stuff, but the part of it is, you know, so, that's what, so anyways, this is called the pre-trib rapture of Christ comes back before the tribulation. There's a mid-trib rapture that says the tribulation period, the first three and a half years aren't so bad, and Christ comes in the middle, and there's, but Buswell held that. He's dead now, so that nobody holds that position anymore, the mid-trib rapture. And then people like Gundry out at a school called, what was the name of that school? I think it was West, uh, it's on the West Coast, Westmont or something. Anyways, there's a guy out of Westmont, uh, Robert Gundry, who taught that Christ comes back after the tribulation. The church goes through the tribulation, and then boom, uh, Christ comes back. So those are kind of what they call pre-trib rapture. Christ comes back before the tribulation, in the mid-trib rapture, in the middle, or post-trib rapture. So you have pre-middle and post-tribulation. Then there's a thousand-year reign of Christ, where Christ rules over the earth. The lion lays down with the lamb. Things are, they beat their swords into plowshares. Everything goes good. Christ rules for a thousand years. And then at the end of that thousand years, this is the Revelation chapter 20 is about the millennium. At the end of that thousand years, Satan is loosed again. He deceives humankind once again. And there's judgment made on the earth. And then they go, New Jerusalem comes down. And New Jerusalem goes on forever and ever. So that's what it goes. This is, New Jerusalem is Revelation 21 and 22, how the book ends with New Jerusalem coming. So this is kind of what's called a kind of a dispensational thing. Not too many people hold this anymore, uh, but I think there may be aspects of it that are right. And so I just need to put that kind of in the back of your head and say this is probably what your grandparents held or whatever, your parents or whatever, something like that. Now, um, we went through some of these things. Um, actually, I'll tell you what. Why don't we, yeah, take a break, and then when we get back, we'll just uh, finish this up. And yeah, so, Thanks. We had, talked, we had talked earlier about the book, one of the characteristics of the book is symbolism. And let me just read some of the symbolism from chapter 1 that he describes. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. When I turned around, I saw seven golden lampstands and seven golden, among the seven lampstands, was someone like the Son of Man dressed in a robe, reaching the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand of the seven golden lampstands is this, the seven stars of the seven angels of the churches and the seven lampstands. And he goes down. Um, and then he says in chapter 13, he uses this. He says, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. And so basically the 666 number was basically to be put on the back of their hands or on their foreheads and stuff. Actually, it's going to be chips. They're going to insert chips into your head. And then instead of creating credit cards, you just go up and do a kind of thing like that for the credit card. And yeah, thanks for laughing. I just made that up. But anyways, I thought it'd be cool. Or they put it in your wrist and stuff like that. And you go up and then, so then now people cut off your wrists and stuff to get your stuff. Uh, okay. So anyways, this is, uh, you know, but it is interesting. Let me just back off. While I made, was making a joke on myself there, it does very interesting. It says this number 666, that you're going to need that number in order to buy or sell anything. That you're going to need that number in order to buy or sell anything. By the way, is it possible in our, by the way, 100 years ago, could, you, could everybody get a mark on them and they had to have their money to buy or sell? Would that, be, would that have been possible 100 years ago, 50 years ago? 
The answer is no. Is it possible now? Yeah, it's possible now. So what I'm saying is for 2,000 years, this has not been possible. It is possible now. So don't you know, totally laugh at these guys as being total fools and stuff. Although, you know what I'm saying, you may want to laugh sometimes and stuff. You can laugh at me and stuff. But, but it's very interesting to me is some of the stuff that it's talking about actually is able to be done now for the first time in 2,000 years. Now, the number 666, I want to go back and I think, I think they need to understand it back then. And so some people have noticed that if you take Nero's name in a certain way, that Nero's name comes out to be the number 666. Remember how we said the numbers and letters are the same? And kind of this, what they call the Gematria principle, where numbers and letters were. And, and some people say that these numbers 666 stands for Nero. And Nero was a great persecutor of the early church um, in the second part of his reign. <laughs> And so that's how they would take that as being back then, uh, this thing with the 666 and how you understand that. Um, Babylon, as we said, and I've actually got the reference here in 1 Peter 5.13. Peter says, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends her greetings, and so does my son Mark. So apparently John Mark was with Peter. They're in Rome. They're in Rome at this time. And he calls it Babylon in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Um, stay away from the pit locusts. Um, by the way, the pit locusts had long hair. And back, um, there was, when I grew up, there were these groups of people they called hippies, okay? Hippies. And the hippies wore long hair. And actually, um, anyways, my wife liked long hair. <laughs> anyways, anyways, and so, but now, unfortunately for her, um, she wants me to grow a ponytail. That's the truth. I'm serious. I'm, ser I'm dead serious. My wife, my wife, Mill, meek and mild, you know, straight as Nero and that Pickard. She, went, she says, why don't you grow a ponytail? Anyways, okay. So we have, you say I have marital problems. But anyways, oh, stink. This is on tape. Um, hi, Annette. I love you. Uh, anyways, but that is the truth. Okay, let me get out of that. Okay, so, but what I'm saying is stay away from newspapers. Stay away from newspaper exegesis where you pick up and whatever is going on in the world, you try to map it in the book of Revelation. I think that's really, can be really damaging. One thing we should note that's really important. Now, this is really important. The book of Revelation is full of Old Testament orientations, allusions and echoes of the Old Testament. The book of Revelation can't be understood without the, book, the Old Testament. It is so full of allusions uh, from the Old Testament. Um, for example, let me just use some of them. Chapter 11, verse 19. It says, Then God's temple in heaven. Where have we seen God's temple? Remember Solomon and God's temple? God's temple in heaven was open, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. So this temple in heaven has got the Ark of the Covenant in it. Do we know from Old Testament, do we know about the Ark of the Covenant? Does anybody remember the three things that were in the Ark of the Covenant? Okay. So those types of things. Nevertheless, he says, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teaching of Balaam. Does anybody remember Balaam, the nasty dude, Balaam in Numbers 22 to 24 there? And actually the book of Revelation refers to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Okay, so he mentions some of this stuff. Um, let me just do another one. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat of the tree of life. The tree of life takes us back to what book? The book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. And by the way, when New Jerusalem, let me just do this one out of my head. Actually, it's chapter 22, verse 14 I see there. When New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven, what tree is in New Jerusalem? The tree of life. The tree of life giving forth its fruit 12, to 12 times a year. So this book of Revelation is, is kind of spectacular um, in some of these Old Testament orientations. And then one that I, I need, this is really kind of a big deal. The plagues of the book of Revelation are modeled on the plagues out of Exodus. Do you remember the 10 plagues of, you know, the sun going dark and the, you know, the locusts coming out and stuff like that? The 10 plagues in Egypt are actually echoed in the book of Revelation. So these, these plagues in the book of Revelation are described um, based on using uh, images out of the Exodus, and the Exodus is very strong there. Um, Another concept that comes up that's really important in this is the one world concept. In the book of Revelation, you've got the whole world coming together against Christ. 
You've got the whole world. So there's this globalization thing going on. And the book of Revelation mentions this. Uh, the whole world comes to battle at Armageddon. All, they gather from all over in this battle of Armageddon uh, where the whole world comes. And so there's this globalization emphasis there. Let me just read 19.19, Revelation 19.19. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured with him, the false prophet, who had performed miraculous signs on his behalf. So they seized. It's interesting to me here. We've got the beast. Let me just do this. Okay. We have in the Trinity, we've got what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've got a, the Trinity. It's called the Trinity. In the book of Revelation, you have an evil trinity. You've got an evil trinity. You've got the beast, you've got the false prophet, and you've got the dragon. And those three, the dragon is Satan, be kind of matched up to God the Father. The beast is more like Christ, and the false prophet is like the Holy Spirit. And so what you've got is this evil trinity then kind of rises up in the, the true trinity. So the one world concept, again, globalization. When does globalization really hit? Is globalization a big thing now? Yeah, I mean, really big thing now. And so it's, it's just interesting, this divine judgment. The book of Revelation can be summarized by these three sets of judgments, okay? The seven seals. Now, what are the seven seals? The seven seals are they're opening a book, and it has in, on your ring, they basically would stamp it like in wax, and so that the seal, and as you pop a seal, you can open the book more. And so basically this book is being opened, and the seals are basically, as they break one after another, another is a judgment on the earth. After the seven seals of this book are opened, and the book is opened, then there's the seven trumpet judgments, where these angels go up and they sound this, and every time an angel sounds a trumpet, there's a plague. And then lastly, there's a bowl's judgments. And these bowls are, been, and it's the bowls of the wrath of God. That's why people don't like the book of Revelation. It talks about these seven bowls, and God's pouring these judgments on the earth from these bowls. So a lot of the book from chapter 4 to about chapter 18, or so 16, is describing these seven seal judgments, the seven trumpet judgments, and the seven bowl judgments. And that's kind of how the book is organized. So it's, it's just disasters on the earth. The book is actually Christ-centered. And Christ is the, the center of the book, which is an, a theme we probably should develop more. Songs and worship. Um, let me just do this. Um, what do they sing in heaven? Here's what they sing in heaven. It says, chapter 5, verses 8 through 14, it says, Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered, uh, and, and was covered with eyes all around, even under their wings. Day and night, they never stop saying, and this is what they say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord all God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So what they say is, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Does that sound familiar to anybody? I think they call it the doxology. Where was that taken from? It's taken from the book of Revelation. That's what they're going to be singing up in heaven. And so it just is, is interesting, the songs and worship. The book of Revelation has a lot about the worship of God. And then the New World Order, um, okay, the New World Order is discussed at the end of the book where basically New Jerusalem comes down and everything is made right. There's the 12 tribes of Israel represented, the 12 apostles are represented, and all God's people are there. In the book of Revelation, it says that they wipe away all tears. So he's going to wipe away all tears. The fact that he wipes away all tears means that what? As New Jerusalem comes down, are there tears? And I go back to this. I think it's a very important passage. Are there tears in heaven? Are there tears in heaven? And the answer is yes. The tears are wiped away, which means there must be tears to be wiped away from. So the New World Order comes down. There is no temple, by the way. In the, at the end of the book, when New Jerusalem comes down, there is no temple. Why is there no temple? Because God is there. In other words, there's no need for a temple. We would, will experience the presence of God. We will be in God's presence. There's no need for the temple. And so ultimately, how should I say, all history climaxes in the... Yeah, let me just say it this way. The climax of history is when humankind meets God face to face. And there's the meeting between us and God. And we meet and we live together forever and ever in peace and harmony and all sorts of wonderful things at the you know paradise and things like that. So the end of the world is basically a, a meeting where we meet Christ face to face. 
and uh, things. Now, the seven churches in the beginning of the book, I don't want to go through all the seven churches and things, although they're fairly interesting. Um, what I do want to do is just read one church. One church is kind of my favorite because I think it's so relevant, and that is uh, the churches that come in this pattern. There's the vision of Christ, accommodation, condemnation, stuff. So this is the pattern that comes up. I don't want you to know that pattern necessarily, but I do want you to listen to this. This is the church of Laodicea. This is the last of the seven churches. Some people think that the seven churches refer to church history. I don't think that's probably correct, but just listen to the last church, the church of Laodicea. See if it sounds familiar. This is Revelation chapter 3, verse 14 and following. It says, To the angel of the church at Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. Okay, so it's got a vision of Christ, the faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation. He said, I know your deeds, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were one or the other. He says, I know your deeds. You're not cold or you're not hot. I wish you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, why are they lukewarm? Why are they repugnant to him? Okay, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can be covered your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. To those I love, I rebuke. And discipline. So be earnest and repent. Be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock, Christ says. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and he would stay with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What was the problem of the church of Laodicea? They thought they were wealth and stuff, and Christ comes down and says, no, you're, you're pitiful. You're pitiful. You think you've got all the things of this world. you got nothing. And so what I'm saying is that, that, that um, Laodicea thing is something to, I think it's a really relevant to today. So, okay, I don't want to go through that, the millennium. Um, okay, I think I'm going to, actually, I think I'm going to call it quits there. Rather than going through all the millennial theories and stuff like that, there's basically three theories. Um, actually, let me just do this one slide and then we'll call it a day. Okay? Um, the premillennial theory says that Christ returns before this thousand year reign of Christ. So in Revelation chapter 20, it talks about basically Satan being locked up in a pit with a, a lock and stuff put under lock and key for a thousand years. Some people think that the thousand years is, is a figurative term. Other people, like myself, I actually think it's a literal term, that Satan will be locked up for a thousand years. That's, and then Christ comes back before the millennium, so that's called premillennialism. Christ comes back before the millennium starts in Revelation 20, and Satan is bound for a thousand years and stuff. That's called premillennialism. There's another approach that says ah millennialism. Ah something means what? If somebody's ah moral, what's that mean? They're not moral. It's alpha privatist. So when you say, ah, millennial, that means there's no, there's no millennium, okay? The reign of Christ is the church. So the millennium is now. Christ ruling rules in our hearts. Satan has been bound by the spread of the church. Satan has been bound. Uh, by the way, when you look around this world, can't you just see Satan's bound everywhere, right? Uh, <clears throat> anyway... Uh, Okay, so this is the amillennial position that Christ rules in the church and that his reign is, there's no millennium per se. It's the, the millennium in Revelation 20 is actually describing the history of the church and Christ's rule of that church. And uh, my question comes back, is Satan really bound now? I don't think so. Is Satan on the, you know what I'm saying? When they're cutting off Christians' heads like they have been, I mean, you've got to ask some questions there. Then there's post-millennial, and post-millennial is even better. These people come out of the 19th century, and they said the world gets better and better and better, and Christ comes after the millennium, 
post-millennial return of Christ, the world gets better and better and better, and finally the world is so stinking good that at the end, Christ comes back and he says, these people are just so wonderful, I'm going to come back to them. And the world gets so good, Christ comes back at the end of this post-millennial because the world has just gotten so good that he says, I can come back now because these people are up to my standards. Uh, when we look around the world, is post-millennium the world getting better and better and better? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this theory has gone out of favor, but it may come back because we're going to make America. Oh, excuse me. Anyways, okay. Better get off that. Anyways, all right. I'm sorry. By the way, I had some students last semester freak out. And they said, it's always making all these political comments. That was a joke, okay? And that, it's, just, it's just incredible to me sometimes. So, okay. I'm sorry. I shouldn't joke around like that. But I just and don't think you know my politics just by stupid jokes like that. But anyways. These are the three positions of the millennium. So there's pre-millennium, Christ comes back at the beginning of the millennium, and then there's a thousand years when Christ reigns, the lion lays down with the lamb, they beat their swords into plowshares of peace, of peace and harmony. The amillennial says that the church is, Christ is ruling in the church right now, so now is the millennium. And post-millennialism, those are guys in the late 19th century, that the world's going to get better and better, and it's going to be so good, Christ's going to come at the end. So it's post-millennial, Christ returns after the millennium, and that position largely been discredited. The point is, and let me just do this to kind of finish up. Let me just tell you about my father, and I'll end with this. Um, and this is an important day for our family in certain regards. So, my dad was one of the, what they used to call the old dispensationalist, okay? He was a fundamentalist, okay? And you guys can all laugh and say, ah, stupid fundamentalist, stupid dispensationalist, and we can, ha, 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 wasn't he stupid? My dad was, was educated in high school and stuff. He worked in a factory all his life. He worked 16 hours a day, much of my life. My father worked 16 hours a day. I didn't know what it was like to work 16 hours a day. Now I'm a teacher, and believe it or not, <laughs> I know what 16 hours a day. Teachers actually work, do some work. Uh, but anyways, uh, I remember my dad, for much of his life, would go to the window, and I can remember it. Sure, he would go to the window, and he'd look out the window, and he would say, you know, Christ might come back today. Christ might come back today. Did that change his life? The hope of Christ's return, did that change his life? The answer is yeah. He lived life saying, hmm, I need to love your mother because Christ may come back today and I want to be loving people and I want to be helping people and stuff like that. And he, he so anticipated his hope was in the return that he could meet this maker who loved him so much that he could meet him. And he just, that changed his life, changed his life. And so what I'm saying is, um, be careful about dismissing all this eschatological. Eschatology means futuristic things. Um, and develop your ethic, allow your ethic, what you ought to do, to be shaped by the fact of, would you do that if Christ were coming back now? Would you be caught doing what you're doing now? And how can you use your time now to praise God? Is it possible, and let me just finish with a Wilson statement, okay? I love Dr. Wilson and stuff like that. Is it possible to study? Is it possible to study for the glory of God? Is it possible that when Christ comes back, he finds you studying history or something like that? You say, oh, no, no. Okay, yes, okay. Is it possible that, that your mind is being engaged and you're saying, how can I use these studies to glorify God? And so what I would suggest, I don't know, is that, that blessed hope of looking for Christ's return and living in light of Christ's return and living in light of Christ's return and saying, Okay, you've been away from home for a while. Some of you have boyfriends and girlfriends at home. If you knew, how should I say, if somebody is coming home, my kids are coming home. Elliot was supposed to come home this summer. Question, do we look forward to his coming home? And is it some, if you love somebody, do you, when they come home, is that a beautiful thing? When you love somebody and when they come home, by the way, when you guys go home, are your parents, are many of your parents going to be looking for you and just love to have you home now because you've been away for a long time and they love you and they want to see you again. And basically, so they, you know, some of you say, your parents say, hey, forget that, man. They're gone now. We're free. Okay. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that if we love Christ, we're going to want to see him. We're going to want to meet him. And just uh, that's a blessed hope. So thanks for taking the class. And I hope you've had a good experience in the New Testament. And just uh, thanks. So, all right. Thank you.
this is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his final lecture in New Testament History, Literature, and Theology, session number 27. This is the book of Revelation. Revelation. 